Um, this is the final live session of the day, and I am so excited to be able to introduce this lineup of speakers. And um, I mentioned it in the introduction this morning with our Chair of Governors, but we have with us today uh, Mrs. Justice Chima Grubb, who was the first Asian woman appointed to the Queen's Bench Division of the High Court in 2015. And when she was in practice, she acted in a number of very high profile cases. We've also got with us Judy Khan, QC, voted Crime Silk of the Year at the Chambers Bar Awards in 2019. Judy specialises in very serious crime and has represented families at the Hillsborough inquests. And we have Karma Melli QC with us, who in 2020 was awarded the Inspirational Women in Law Barrister of the Year. She prosecutes a string of grooming trials in the Northeast, and she is an expert in the handling of vulnerable witnesses and children. So it doesn't really need any more introduction from me to tell you how lucky you are to have uh, these wonderful people with us today who are going to help you understand what it takes to impress in court. And each of them now, in turn, uh, starting with Judy, are going to tell you a little bit about uh, the work they do and, and uh, the background to the advice that they're going to give you. Judy. Thank you, Linda. Um, just a very short introduction to me, really. Um, I was called to the bar in 1989. Um, in fact, at the same time as Mrs. Chi McGrubb, we were contemporaries at bar school. Uh, I was appointed as a QC in 2010. Uh, I sit as a part-time judge uh, in the Crown Court, that's a recorder. And again, in uh, alongside Mrs. Chi McGrubb, we did our training to be recorders at the same time. And uh, obviously she's gone to the dizzier heights than myself. Uh, I was a joint head of chambers in Garden Court up until January of this year. I did my four year stint and then I stepped down. My practice has typically involved dealing with serious crime. I most usually defend in murder cases. I, I exclusively defend, but typically in murder cases, I do represent people in uh, sex cases and they're, they're very different, obviously very different types of work uh, and they have their own challenges, each of them very different. My one major departure from criminal practice was that for two years, I represented 77 families in the Hillsborough inquest. And it's a football disaster that, that took place before I'm sure all of you were born in 1989. And I led a, a team, I was part of a, a really large team of about 23 barristers representing 77 of the families. There were 96 deceased. My particular smaller team within that group dealt with the medical and pathological evidence. And I led that small team. So it was very technical, complicated evidence. It was completely out of my comfort zone because I don't deal with inquests. But ultimately, it was without a shadow of a doubt, the most important, uh, interesting, challenging, inspirational thing that I ever did in my career. And it's the proudest moment really to have been involved in that, because I'm sure you'll know that it involved writing an injustice that had persisted for over 25 years. And so my part in that process was a small part overall, but nevertheless, I was really proud to be part of that. And just to put into context, because we're all going to talk a little bit more about hearings later, so I'll give some tips on dealing with trials in particular. But just to put into context what I've just said, I think I've done OK in my practice. I think I've done OK at the bar. But uh, when I left school, I went to college to do my A-levels. And I, I was a state school uh, student. And when I had my careers taught with my lecturer, who, to be fair, taught me A-level math, so I don't think it was necessarily unreasonable that he had very limited expectations of me. But when I told him that I wanted to do a law degree, he took a long pause, uh, gave me a penetrating stare and said, well, have you thought about doing something like nursery nursing instead? And I, I don't denigrate from nursery nursing. It's a, a, obviously a very important career in itself. And obviously, as a mother of children, I know the importance of that. But what he was really saying is, this isn't for you. You're not good enough to do it. And I remember looking at him and thinking, that's really wrong. I'm not going to argue with you because 
I, I think I can do this. And I'm glad that I didn't listen to his advice because I've really enjoyed the challenges of a career at the bar. And um, just one final word as well. I applied for pupillage, having been through bar school. I applied, in fact, to Garden Court. It was one of the sets that I applied to. And many years later, when I was made a, a tenant there, having first gone somewhere else, done my pupillage somewhere else, become a tenant somewhere else, I found a letter in a box, which was a reply to my pupillage application in about 1988, in which I was told, very uh, sorry to tell you that your application for pupillage has been unsuccessful. So I didn't even scrape uh, through to get an interview at Garden Court, and it tickled me when many years later I was made head of chambers. And I suppose the moral in all of that is have some self-belief and don't be put off when people say no. That's my introduction. Well, I'm Bobby Chima Grubb, a judge of the High Court. I'm assigned to the Queen's Bench Division. And as Judy's just told you, I was called to the bar in 1989 at the same time that she was. I practiced then in criminal law for over 25 years. And during that time, I defended and prosecuted, mainly in London, but uh, also occasionally around the country. I specialized in fraud for a while, um, but after I'd had my three children, because my chambers were one of the sets that provided Treasury Council to the Old Bailey, um, and they are a group that are appointed to prosecute the most serious homicides and terrorism cases and other sensitive matters, I decided to put my hat in the ring for that. I wasn't successful the first time. They took two people from my chambers, but not me. And I tried again. And the second time I was uh, allowed to become a monetary for Treasury Council. Um, and after joining the monitoring scheme, I really didn't look back. After a few years, unlike my two colleagues, I was appointed junior Treasury Council. I worked there at the Old Bailey for most of the following 12 years. I became Queen's Council, um, Senior Treasury Council, um, a Deputy High Court Judge, a Recorder, and eventually in 2015, a full-time High Court Judge. So I sat as a Recorder from about 2006. That means that I was sitting as a part-time judge some of the time, and the rest of the time I was practicing in court as a barrister. And it was remarkable how much I felt I learned from the experience of sitting at the same time that I was making arguments and running cases in court. As a judge now, my work is very varied. I sit in the administrative court, hearing judicial review applications. I sit in the court of protection, dealing with people who are not able to make decisions about their own lives, very heartbreaking cases. I also sit in the Court of Appeal Criminal Division. I'm one of the four presiding judges on the Southeastern Circuit, and this week I became the lead presiding judge. I also sit in serious criminal trials in the Crown Court. So I'm about to start on Monday a six-handed contract killing murder at Southwark Crown Court. When I was a barrister, my favorite cases were always the most complicated and difficult ones. And sometimes when the Director of Public Prosecution um, or the head of the Counterterrorism Division had a particularly tricky case, uh, and they would ask who was interested in doing it, I would put my hand up. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't lost that bad habit. I'm still like that. Over the past 15 years, I've seen many, many advocates appearing in court. I've seen Judy Kahn, Queen's Counsel, and she is one of the very best. And I've never lost my fascination for what it is that makes someone good and someone else brilliant. And I hope to be able to share some of those thoughts I've had about it um, during the course of this morning or this afternoon, even as it is now. Thank you, Karma. Hello um, and welcome. My name's Karma Melly QC. I suppose I became a barrister having become involved in politics in the 1980s, as was almost obligatory back then, frankly. 
um, and I enjoyed the debate. And so I wanted to be an advocate rather than I wanted to be a lawyer. It had never crossed my mind to be a solicitor. That wasn't what drove me at all. Um, in terms of getting there, you know, a slightly um, lengthy route, perhaps, moved out of home, A-levels at night school, ended up um, coming to Leeds University, and I was called in 1997 to the bar. I also didn't find pupillage straight away. I intended to be in London. That didn't happen for me immediately, and a pupillage came up in Leeds, and I thought, well, why not go back? I'm from London, I intended to live there, and I thought I'd come up and do pupillage and then see what happens, and um, I'm still here. So I've now lived in Leeds longer than anywhere else. Uh, I started with a very mixed practice, genuinely doing everything, um, employment, immigration, family, crime, kind of how it was for some pupils then. Um, eventually ended up specialising in crime, took Silk in 2016, and to an extent, um, we developed my mixed practice again. So I do some family work, particularly where I'm dealing with sexual offences or um, extreme injuries to children. I was also involved um, in the High Court litigation, the largest ever brought against the Catholic Church in, in respect of child abuse. I think I too suffer from what my friend has called chronic participation syndrome, along with the rest of my panel. Um, and so, yes, I, I involve myself in a number of different projects. I'm a recorder in Family and Crime, venture at Middle Temple and a governor at the Inns of Court College of Advocacy, chair of the North Eastern Circuits Women's Forum. Um, in terms of advocacy, uh, I now predominantly prosecute, when I'm in the criminal world, predominantly prosecute grooming cases. I think my proudest moments in advocacy are probably in the first few years of my practice where you had those cases um, where... It's, it's a little different, the impact you could make in terms of a murder sentence, perhaps. Um, but when you are dealing with young people and the vulnerable, having an advocate that can help them through the process and really get a judge to see things from their perspective, um, I think would be my proudest moment. Thank you all so much. Um, we're now going to move on to the second part of this session. Um, how to impress a judge in different types of hearing. And we're going to start with um, Mrs. Chima Grubb on short pre-trial and other hearings. Okay, well, I'm going to share some um, ideas with you about how to impress judges in the sort of short hearings that uh, all barristers and advocates have to take part in. Pre-trial hearings, bail applications, short legal arguments, which can arise in the middle of trials and so on. So first of all, remember that you begin your advocacy before you ever get into court. If you're sending a document to the court, make sure it's concise and grammatical. Judges are usually working under time pressure and a helpful document which sets out simply what you are after, what are likely to be the controversial or contested points and why they should be decided in your favour are much more helpful to a judge than a detailed, no doubt accurate, dissertation on the relevant law. And if you can, try and make your document read like a ruling in your favour. Secondly, make sure that you've spoken to your opponent about whatever's about to happen in court. There's no credit in springing arguments upon the opposition these days, if there ever was. The court needs to know what you each think about each other's case. And in my experience, often a cordial chat before you go into court can work to reduce the areas that you disagree about. I remember recently reading papers in a pretrial legal argument the prosecution wanted to adduce some bad character evidence. The evidence was going to come from abroad. And the skeleton argument from the defence challenged the um, admissibility of this foreign evidence. And I thought I was going to have to give a detailed ruling on jurisdictional issues, uh, including um, cross-border cooperation and so on. Um, and I have to say, I wasn't looking forward to hearing that argued. 
uh, particularly as one side seemed to me to have a very strong argument. Well, imagine my delight when prosecution counsel stood up to introduce the argument and told me that in discussions with his opponent, they had agreed what could and could not be proved. And so all that I had to rule on was whether the test for admissibility in this court, in this country, under the Criminal Justice Act 2003, about how relevant the evidence was to the issues in the case was met. Also speak to the court staff, make a friend of the usher, he or she will tell you how things are going, even what mood the judge is in. And if you can, go and sit in court early. Watch for yourself what the temperature is um, and become comfortable in that space. I used to do this all the time when I was at the bar. I learned so much just by watching other advocates in court. Free lessons in advocacy are available in every court, every day. What to do and what not to do, both are equally important. Thirdly, when you get into court, personal presentation. Be transparent. You shouldn't look as if you are trying to get a job. You're not presenting yourself. You are actually presenting one of the parties in the case. The court, particularly the judge, should be able to see through you to the argument you're putting forward on behalf of your client. There are exceptions to this. Sometimes when you are defending in a criminal case, you need to get yourself in front of your client in the eyes of the jury so they see you. But when you are advocating to the judge, you must never get in the way of the argument. So look neat, put your hair back, stand up straight, hold your head up. Looking like that makes you look like a winner. In court itself, you will impress the judge if you stand up. And you'll say to me, oh, but Mrs. Justice Chima Grubb, I always stand up in court. But do you do that when you're appearing on CBP? Most advocates do not stand up. I can tell you in my experience, the best ones do. Standing up changes the way that you speak, how much you feel you're able to own the room with your body, and it feels much more like being in court rather than speaking to granny over Zoom. Next, make eye contact with the judge. I see many counsel making good arguments to me, but I never get to look them in the eye. And you know, it really does make a difference. If you have the confidence of what you're saying to look the person you're saying it to in the eye, then that does add power to the words that you're using. When you're making a short application or responding to one, it helps to think like the judge. Do I need to be told what the Bail Act says? Well, probably not. But I do need to know how you meet the objections that the prosecution have put forward to bail for your client. Go straight to the heart of such things. Does he have an address? Has it been checked? Will he be spending his time with trustworthy people? Those sorts of details mean that the judge can grant bail. Let me give you an example just from yesterday. Um, I am going to be the judge trying three men who have all been convicted of terrorist offences uh, for their alleged involvement in an assault on a prison officer while they were in custody. Even though they're all serving prisoners, the custody time limits still apply to them. And the prosecution is making an application to extend the custody time limits in their cases. Now, the criminal procedure rules explain how long, how much notice the defence must have of such applications. Defence had not had the number of days notice that they should have had for yesterday's hearing. And defence counsel told me that the prosecution had not complied with that bit of the criminal procedure rules. Having said that, she moved straight on to her substantive objections to the application. 
What impression did she make on me? Well, shall I tell you, it was clear to me that she wasn't going to let the prosecution get away with it. But on the other hand, she was ready. She didn't need to ask for more time. She mentioned it so that I knew that she knew that they had not complied, but it didn't need to be banned home. So focusing on what you actually want from the court is really the way you want to set yourself. Another example, I touch type in court. And when somebody's making an argument that I find persuasive, I usually start touch typing. The smart advocates slow down when they see me touch typing. Sometimes they just stop until I stop and then they carry on again. The not so impressive ones just don't notice. They're too busy focusing on what they have to say and not thinking about the impression that they're making. Advocates who tailor their presentation to the court are much more impressive than those who are just banging on, saying what they feel they have to say. I was listening to an appeal a few weeks ago in the Court of Appeal with two colleague judges. Counsel was getting rather excited and it was as if he was addressing a jury, communicating emotionally in an impassioned way to them about the point he wanted to make. If somebody had said to him, do you think doing advocacy in front of the Court of Appeal is the same as doing advocacy in front of a jury? He would have said, of course not. But actually the way he did it belied that principle. Those are just a few of the thoughts I would say about pre-trial and short hearings. Thank you, Judy. You're going to deal for us with trials. Thank you, Linda. Um, well, first of all, there are an infinite variety of trials that you'll have to deal with. So uh, it's hard to be prescriptive about what you do, but I'm just going to give you some pointers. And in fact, some of what the other panelists will say later about top tips will also apply when you're doing your trial preparation. So um, the first and most important thing is to identify the issues. What are the issues in the case? Because once you've identified those, a number of other things flow from that. It will inform what witnesses you require to attend. If it's an identification case um, for a robbery, for example, you may not need the complainant to attend. If your case is, it wasn't me, I wasn't there, depending on what the complainant said. If the complainant identified your client, then obviously you would need the complainant to attend. So the first point is, identify the issues in the case. Secondly, having identified that those issues, know the law, prepare in advance. Uh, I, I defend, so looking from a defense perspective, once you know the issue and what your defense is, make sure you know any relevant law that applies to that defense. You'll want to consider what legal issues arise in the case. Quite often, there will be a bad character application uh, sometimes you might not know about that until very shortly before the hearing. So you also have to try to anticipate what legal issues might arise. Again, that will inform uh, what uh, research you need to do and what preparation you need to do. Uh, an important consideration is once you've identified those issues, you, you will actually need to apply some filter. Whatever side you're on in the courtroom, you, you need to look critically at what those issues are and what defence, if you're defending, you're advancing. And sometimes you will need to say to your client, that is not a realistic position to take. And obviously the code of conduct is such, we don't just make up our client's instructions. Obviously we're not permitted to do that, but you will sometimes need to challenge your client. So for example, if they're saying, well, it just so happens that I lost my phone within the half a minute of the incident happening, for it never to go back on again, for me to never try to get another phone with that same number, you, you might want to say, it rather looks as though you may have ditched that phone. And if you did, was there a reason why you did it? Because it might be consistent with your innocence. So rather than embark on a, a lying account in any respect, you need to be realistic. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, where I wasn't able to persuade my client to apply realism, uh, it was a case where the client had, uh, as it transpires from the jury's verdict, murdered their partner. And 
the defence that was advanced involved, first of all, denying causation of the fatal injuries. Secondly, suggesting that such injuries as were caused were inflicted in self-defence. Thirdly, to suggest that although they were in self-defence, in fact, the person had also lost their self-control. And just to round it off, we were also advancing diminished responsibility. I'm bound to say I, I've never advanced that many defences in, in any one case. And I did try to persuade this client that applying the usual filter, this is not likely to be persuasive to the jury, particularly the self-infliction of injuries point. But this person was undeterred and needless to say, uh, was convicted in fairly short order. So you, you can try to apply a filter, obviously consistent with being within the code, and at the end of the day, ultimately following your client's instructions. Uh, the second point is, in respect of, of uh, preparation, having identified which witnesses are required, uh, you will also want to keep in mind when you do that, when you embark on that process, remember that every witness that you require to attend is a potential hostage to fortune. So where a witness doesn't really impact on your case, uh, but you think, well, there might be something helpful that comes out of that, just remember that every time somebody attends court and steps into that witness box, you do not have ultimate control on what they're going to say. And very often you come a cropper because a witness will volunteer some very damning detail that's not in their witness statement and simply saying, well, you didn't say in that your witness statement isn't necessarily going to get you out of trouble if they say, well, that's because I didn't remember it at the time because I was so distraught as a result of the incident. So do remember when you require witnesses, each witness is a hostage to fortune. Require only those that you need to challenge or where there really is something that you intend to bring out or expand upon from their evidence. Uh, if you defend, then the next thing that you have to bear in mind is of those witnesses that you have required, you will have to cross-examine them. And there's a really important golden rule that is in, in any cross-examination, which is as far as possible, uh, don't ask questions that you don't know the answer to. And if I have time at the end, I'll give you a very good example of where, uh, again, that was a bit of a difficulty for me, but I, I may not have time because I know we're slightly behind time. So do bear in mind, plan your cross-examination in advance, try to ask questions where you can gauge what, what the answer is going to be. And sometimes you won't know the answer because you have to put a positive case and, and that requires sometimes venturing into the unknown. But generally speaking, try to avoid that. You will want to consider, if you're calling your client to give evidence when you're defending, you'll want to consider one, do you really need to call them to give evidence? Obviously there are adverse inferences if you, do, if you don't call them, but do you need to call them? If you are going to call someone to give evidence, be they client or any witness, plan it in advance. Planning is everything, it's key. So where you have documents that is a part of your client's narrative, be ready to deploy them, know where they are, have the reference points. I usually draft what I call an outline of evidence and in that one document, it will have every reference to every document that I'm going to refer my client to in the course of evidence in chief so that you don't have a frantic scrabbling around trying to remember where a particular item is. So do um, prepare and plan in advance and create an outline of their evidence. And finally, the final part in the trial process is a closing speech. And although I, I know some judges say, well, closing speeches don't win or lose cases, I think every now and then they, they do. I do think that they have the capacity to do that in the right case. But whether that's right or wrong, the most important thing that you'll do in a closing speech is draw together the strands of your case, whatever side you're on, whatever the, the case is. Do make notes. This is absolutely critical. Do make either bullet point notes or, as I quite often do, actually prepare the whole thing, write it all out. Maybe not every the and and, but have a proper framework that you can use. It's like a comfort blanket in a way to know that you have it once you've written it out and you've gone through it a few times, quite often you can deliver it with scant uh, note, with scant regard to actually what's on the written page because you just know it inside out. But do 
have written it out because it helps you order your thoughts and have a structure. Uh, I, I know two people who told me before speeches, I never write my speeches out. And I found myself thinking at the end of both of their speeches that they perhaps ought to do so. Because in the case of one of them, he got every witness's name wrong. And it was almost impossible to work out who on earth he was referring to during the course of this unstructured, rather rambling address. So don't be scared to be prepared and to write notes out. Don't think that that is a weakness. It's part of the important and essential preparation. And aside from everything else, and this goes for, for jury speeches or, or if you're in, in a magistrate's court, know your tribunal. Pitch your advocacy to your tribunal, be it speech or any other hearing. If you're in front of Mrs. Justice Chima Grubb, then you know you have to be properly prepared. You know that she'll be properly prepared and you can know that she will have read the papers and you don't need to go through absolutely everything. If you're in front of a jury, you're less able to take that for granted. You need to make sure that they know all of your key points. So you pitch your advocacy according to your tribunal. That's the most important thing to bear in mind. So um, th those are my tips on trials. Thank you, Judy. And Karma, you're going to give us your tips in regards to sentencing. Thank you. Um, a, a lot of the advice you've already had is equally applicable to sentencing hearings, I would say, at the outset. So in terms of watching courts, I don't think there's any better experience. I mean, I think it's still Fridays are heavy sentencing days that whenever you're out of court, and I did this even, you know, once qualified, go and spend that day any gaps between your hearings and going to listen to the judge and you get a real sense of what particular issues a judge has in mind or her mind and the level of sentence they're likely to impose perhaps we have more consistency these days but still it's an incredibly helpful exercise and the other matters about standing particularly when you're on cbp um, having your hair tied back and, and just putting yourself in the most presentable way, of course, is applicable to sentencing. But a few tips on either side, really. I thought about it, but I think, generally speaking, they are different pieces of advice that you would give depending on whether you're prosecuting or defending in a sentence. So a few pointers if you're um, prosecuting a sentence. Most courts, most judges require a sentencing note these days, not always, but it is very helpful to do one. There is little point uploading it just before the judge starts their list. They will have had to have prepared it beforehand, normally the day before. Um, if you cannot perhaps upload the sentencing note until the morning because you have commitments the night before, then even a note or an email indicating when it would be available is helpful. It's quite frustrating when you spend ages working on a chronology yourself when you're sitting as the judge and then you then you receive one, for example. Uh, so yes, a sentencing note, very helpful. As part of that, and I know I mentioned this when we come on to the other tips, that a chronology is almost always the way to present a sentence in terms of date order. There are occasionally cases which, which require a different perspective, but I think a chronology is very helpful and that includes incorporating the antecedent history. There is nothing worse than perhaps opening a complex sentence and then realising you've missed something on the previous convictions, which means that an offence was committed during perhaps a suspended sentence order. And that suspended sentence order was imposed in part for breach of a community order, which was imposed in part for breach of a conditional discharge. And you suddenly realise you needed the details of about another 10 previous offences and the whole case is going to go off and you could have sorted that and saved the time yourself by double checking, realising there was a breach and going to get the details to make sure it is an effective hearing. So yeah, really do have a look at the antecedents and see if there are breaches of other court orders, other sentencing. A um, couple of other tips when prosecuting. It's rare for a judge to need the history of the investigation. So there's little point saying there was a robbery. Uh, there were three eyewitnesses and they saw perhaps a blue distinctive coat and the blue distinctive coat meant the police could go and find them at this and so forth. What you want to tell the judge is there was a robbery and the details of it. Sometimes it's helpful to set out perhaps how overwhelming the evidence was. 
but you don't need to present the case by commencing with the police investigation. You commence with the offence itself. Um, so those are uh, some dotes. One more dote, please, if you're prosecuting, try and stay away from police language. It's often there in the statements and it becomes... Um, it can become quite comfortable in your mouth to open things in police language or in terms of the offence. And you're opening it for the judge, but also for members of the public. So you don't need to say um, the defendant, having entered as a trespasser, stole therein a television and a video. You can say the defendant smashed the back window and broke into the property and take out that police language. Um, I did it once myself and I was pulled up on it. So that's why it's definitely lodged in my mind not to do that. Um, one other tip if you're prosecuting, do so, spend some time really thinking about the ancillary orders, sexual harm prevention orders, restraining orders, financial orders at the end of the case, even victim surcharges. There's just a lot to remember these days for sentencing. Your judge will really appreciate it. If there's a few bullet points, just saying what the other ancillary orders would be. So those are my top tips for prosecutors. Moving to defense, and there's two sides of a coin here. So on one side is be realistic. It's not like a defendant giving you their defense, which you are obliged really to put, even if you think it's nonsensical. But sentencing is different. You're not obliged to tell the judge that you think it should be a conditional just discharge for three offenses of murder. So be realistic about what the sentencing framework is. The other side of that coin is, if you're defending and you really need a judge to be perhaps brave in her decisions, or it's an extraordinary, exceptional case, and you need the judge to really go out and listen and think about the fact that this is different in some way, then do it and be brave and go for it. And don't water it down by, well, if you're not with me, maybe don't look much too long. You know, if you believe that and that this is a case where you need to explain that, then just be brave and go for it. A couple of other tips. Um, Try and let the judge know in advance if there's going to be significant documents, references, medical records. Uh, again, it can be quite frustrating if you sit where you've read everything, you form a view, and then you get one document that perhaps then explains that they've got eight disabled children, which will all be removed into care. And you have to kind of take yourself back out of the thought process you've gone down. So try and let the judge know, even if you don't have them available, perhaps, the heads up on what you're going to supply in advance when you're defending. Um, another do is back to those in ancillary orders. Most of them go through on the nod, an awful lot of them. Sometimes they're very complex and they need particular court time and maybe skeleton arguments. So if there's real submissions about a ban, financial orders, sexual harm prevention orders, something like that, again, I do recommend that you let your judge know. She'll be grateful to know that there's going to be something controversial that might need orders for skeleton arguments or for more court time. Um, those are my top tips for sentencing. Thank you, Karma. And we're staying with you. And I hope everybody's now got their pens and notebooks out for quick fire tips um, about preparation. Karma, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I thought I'd done well and kept with it. My apologies. So um, some top top tips. Some of them you, perhaps are echoes of what you've heard, but we're hoping that this really does become enshrined. Number one is whatever your case, whatever field of law you're in, let's start with what the allegations actually are. Why are you there? So if you're in a criminal case, strongly recommend you start with the indictment, actually work out what the charges are, look at the ingredients of the offence, go back to basics perhaps, pull up your basic textbook your Ar or your Archbold Blackstones and have a look at what the ingredients are for that offence before you start to read the case. You can otherwise, you can get quite far into a case and realise that you haven't been trying to look for those most important elements of it, the ingredients. And that is true, therefore, whether you're in a different field. So in the family law, start with the pleading. Sorry, start with the threshold. What is the allegation? What are you trying to prove if you're for the local authority? 
What are you trying to defend if you're for the respondent for the family? And the same in civil cases, start with the pleadings. Know what's being alleged before you start reading. Number, number in fact, I'll, I'll move these around, I think. So no, my second tip really does draw on what I've just said. So try not to waste your own time rereading and re-preparing a case over and over again. So once you've worked out what the allegations are, what you're either trying to prove, disprove and defend, as you start to read the case, make notes as you go through it. Um, start to realise, start to be aware of what the applications are, where the issues will be where the fight is going to be, and start to note it as you read and as you go through it. Because it's very frustrating having spent that time on the initial reading to then have to go back and do it again a couple of weeks later because you're now fulfilling the order for perhaps hearsay or bad character. And you have to go back and start to trawl it all again. Whereas if you just noted those legal issues as you went through, you'd find you'd saved yourself an awful lot of preparation time. My next tip draws on that need to prepare and to try and limit the amount of time you spend prepare, wasting your own time in preparing cases. So prepare a crib sheet as you go through. Sometimes you need a, a few lines to tell yourself what that piece of evidence was, the significance of it. Sometimes it can be a one line, one line description of, you know, Caesar's exhibits. And it just means you don't have to go back and read that page, read that statement again. So a crib sheet of just what every statement is, what every exhibit is. If you can prepare that for yourself, particularly in the smaller cases, then you can easily recall the evidence. When a witness is mentioned, you don't have to go back and read their statement. You just go back and read that one line description of their evidence. Next top tip, very similar to what I said about sentence, really, in terms of just having the fixed chronology of events settled in your mind. And as I said earlier, it is almost always best to present cases in terms of date, occasionally, because of a complex, often in a family dynamic, you actually need to come at it in a different way. But the vast majority of the time, dealing with things in date order will really cement them in your mind and make you see the significance of pieces of evidence. So it's very helpful to prepare a chron chronology. It can end up being of enormous assistance for you, your client, the officers, perhaps, um, and indeed the judge. My last tip for you in terms of preparation is as you go through your reading, your noting, your preparing your bullet points for the legal arguments, as you go through that, your preparation shouldn't just be through your own lens. You need to be viewing the evidence through the lens of the other side, other sides perhaps, as to where your weaknesses are, where they will come at you essentially in terms of exposing the problems that you've got in your case. So as you're reading, as you're noting, as you're preparing, think very seriously about the weaknesses in your submissions. Are there perhaps some authorities that could assist you deal with them or exclude that part of the evidence? Or are you going to have to make concessions in relation to parts of the evidence and find your best way through it, having accepted the difficulties? So, um, don't just spend your time seeing all the positives in your case. Be alert to the weaknesses from the very outset as well and enable to, you to give the best possible advice as well to your clients. Thank you, Karma. Judy, can we come to you for your top tips? Yeah, thank you, Linda. Um, inevitably, there's a little bit of overlap with our top tips. Uh, my first top tip, in fact, Karma's already touched upon, which is preparation. Preparation is absolutely key. Know your brief inside out. Make sure you've read everything. And uh, as Karma has said, the, the one line description uh, is absolutely vital. If I can, obviously it depends on having the time to do it. I prepare schedules of all the evidence. So the schedule of all the witness statements. And in that document, if a witness refers to an exhibit, I'll put the exhibit reference in there. 
And it really pays dividends later down the line because what happens in a trial is someone will say, well, exhibit blah was found at such and such place. And you think, well, which exhibit is that? Who produced that? You, you do a search in your exhibit schedule or your witness schedule and you can get all the cross-referencing for that particular item. So it really does pay dividends. And there's a, another really important dividend that it pays, which is this. It really helps to calm your nerves. If you're feeling anxious about a case, once you get into the detail and you have it all scheduled and you know you've prepared it properly, it really has the effect of calming your nerves down because there's one thing you can control in the courtroom. Quite often you can't control the answers you get. You can't control what your client will do, uh, but you can control your preparedness. You can control knowing the case inside out, which is half the battle, frankly. Secondly, presentation. Uh, professional presentation is absolutely vital. And the best way that you can achieve that is to have everything at your fingertips. Now, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a dinosaur. The younger generation do everything electronically. They, they're able to navigate their papers electronically without printing things out. And I'm afraid to say that I, I haven't quite got to that level of proficiency. So I, if I'm going to cross-examine a witness, I have all the key documents printed out on paper so that I can put index tabs on it. I can navigate my way through a cross-examination or evidence in chief by referring to the various documents which I have tabbed up. I know where they are in my bundle. I know where I can find them and what passages are important. I have all of that at my fingertips. And if you're going to work electronically, just make sure that you can do that in the same way, because I can assure you that one minute in court when you're silent, searching for something, feels like the equivalent of an hour. Um, and nobody will thank you for it if you're keeping everyone waiting while you try to struggle to find a, a particular document. So presentation uh, requires you to have everything at your fingertips and know where all of your documents are. Thirdly, analyze the issues critically. And I've touched on this already. Don't just uh, take what uh, a client says without any filter at all. You, you may need to challenge where, where necessary. Fourthly, uh, research the relevant law. Make sure you do that in advance. Do not overburden the court with authorities. You won't be thanked for that, as Mrs. Chi McGrubb will tell you, Mrs. Justice Chi McGrubb will tell you, if there's one guideline case, you refer to that. You don't need the 20 authorities that preceded it. No one will thank you for that. Uh, finally, tip number five, think ahead and be organized. And I mean there, not just with the one case that you're dealing with, as a, a barrister, we're often dealing with many, many cases, not just a trial you're dealing with in court, but a short hearing coming up, a defense statement that has to be served, et cetera. Keep on top of your deadlines, know what hearings are coming up um, so that you can prepare in advance because otherwise things have an unfortunate tendency to concertina to one point uh, and you don't always have the time to deal with everything. So try to front load your work and meet your deadlines before don't wait for them to hit you when you might suddenly have five deadlines all at the same time the following day. And I just want to say one final thing, which is a, a, a Nelson Mandela quote, um, which I think is well worth keeping in mind, um, because after 32 years of doing this job, I still am very affected if I sit down and I think that cross-examination went appallingly, I lost control of the witness, I didn't achieve what I set out to achieve. And the quote is this, do not judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. And it's an important thing to bear in mind because you will sometimes fall down in this job. It's inevitable. Things don't always go according to plan. And you have to be resilient to that. Know that we are all in that position. Nobody does this job without from time to time thinking that really could have gone much better. I didn't do that as well as I could do. And you need to develop some resilience and just think, I can get back up tomorrow. I'll do it better. Those are my top tips. Thank you so much, Judy, for that and for your honesty. And our last and final five top tips. Thank you so much. OK, um, five top tips. Um, first of all, never read out what you have put down in writing. The judge will switch off and you will waste your time. Secondly, brevity is your friend and judges often associate 
the degree of brevity with the quality of the advocate. David Panic QC is a prime example of that. My son went to watch him uh, in the Supreme Court during the uh, Miller um, litigation. And he said, whatever happened uh, when anybody else spoke, once David Panic was speaking, the judges really took notice because he never spoke for very long. Thirdly, never interrupt the judge, even if she has just interrupted you. Her mind will be working and you need to let her work the idea she has out. Listen, answer the question and then get back to where you were. Fourthly, what you should be aiming for is a respectful intellectual equality with the judge. One of the ways to achieve that is, as Judy says, to know your case better than anybody else in the room. When I used to prosecute terrorist suspects, I used to love it when I stood up to cross-examine them because I knew that I knew their case better than they did. And I knew that if it went well, as Judy says, it doesn't always go as well as you hope, but if it went well, then I would be able to use the knowledge I had about their case against them to try and expose them. Fifthly, be all eyes and ears when you are addressing the court. Watch the judge, are your points hitting home? When you've made a strong point or you're about to move on to another topic, pause. It's very difficult to stop and listen to the silence, but learn the power of the pause. And overall, shall I tell you a little secret, which is that happy people who are confident in their right to be there, to be in the space, who know that they belong, make the best advocates because they're not worrying about loads of other things. They're just focusing on what they're there to do. And if you have been given the privilege of standing up in court, then you belong and you deserve to be happy and confident and comfortable. Thank you so very much. Um, we can all see from the comments how well received this session has been and how grateful all the attendees are for your honesty and your candor and your vast experience. So thank you all so very much. Um, it just remains for me now to invite any of the attendees to hop over to the networking sessions to speak to one of the ICCA academic staff one to one. Um, if you'd like to do that, uh, but I'm basking on your behalf in all of the lovely comments that are coming your way. And I really can't thank you all enough. Thank you. Not at all. Thank you.